Hello, Culture Matters Podcast. I'm very excited to introduce you to our guest. Before I do that, here's a quote I picked just for this episode. Quote, history is a record of effects, the vast majority of which nobody intended to produce. Joseph Schumpeter. Hope I said that right. Welcome back, Bill Mervin. If you're listening to this, go to episode 122. Bill is a good friend of the Culture Matters podcast. He's been on the show now. This will be the third time. But episode 122 of recent, this is about just as much a part two of that episode. So please listen to that. Bill has been a supporter of the Culture Matters podcast and me personally as a friend for many years. And I always love having you on, brother. What happened this week with uh, some type of bank? You know, it's funny. I feel like I've had my head down somewhere else. And I'm like, I don't even know what you're talking about, frankly, before we popped in here. So what what happened this week? Because, yeah. Yeah. So, um, well, well, we'll we'll see when we wake up tomorrow morning. But, um, you know, on, on our last podcast, we discussed uh, it was the weekend of the uh, Silicon Valley Bank um, collapse. Uh, and then uh, First Republic was also. Um, another bank that was uh, having some issues. Um, they didn't fully collapse, however. And, you know, a big part of our discussion was, you know, as it relates to kind of the direction of the Fed and the direction of the economy from here was, you know, these two kind of thesis that either A, that, you know, the Fed had really broken something and um, that this was the start of a series of dominoes to fall in terms of credit contraction and <clears throat> bank failures, et cetera, you know, or, you know, was this isolated to some, you know, some banks that, um, you know, just took on too much risk and uh, too much um, concentrated risk. Uh, these were banks that, you know, were big into tech uh, and uh, big into, um, you know, some crypto and things like that. And, uh, and was it, you know, were they going to come in aggressively, put a ring around these banks and, uh, you know, kind of isolate the problem? Uh, and it, it appeared that the second, the latter was was kind of winning out. It hadn't, uh, it did seem like the, the immediate crisis abated in the regional banks. They rallied a bit and uh, after our last meeting, but now on Friday, uh, First Republic was down 30 some percent and I think 40 some percent in future trading over the weekend or something. First Republic cool. Bank. I've seen them all over the place. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, so I'm just actually literally just flipped on Bloomberg right now. So it, it looks like either it's going to be a forced sale. So FDIC, Bloomberg, FDIC asks banks for final First Republic bids due on Sunday. So if they can get some big players, right? So the big players uh, have a vested interest in the banking prices not uh, expanding out. Firstly, because, you know, of the potential domino effect of, of bank failures. Um, sometimes... Sometimes, I'm not saying this is the case, sometimes it's not always the reality, but the perception, as we both know, in, in financial markets. So if the perception is that the crisis is worsening, then it'll put pressure on all the financials. Um, you know, and, and secondly, there is there is some, you know, uh, you know, the other thing I would argue is, you know, when they had the big bailout with SVB, they talked about you know an increased surcharge to replenish the fdic um you know reserve if you will and they're all they're going to assess that to the biggest bank so long and short is they're either going to i saw some rumblings about the fdic taking over first republic it appears right now what they're going to do is try to create a fire sale and have one of the big players step up and reluctantly take it um but it the, what I've seen says that if they can't get anybody to buy it at a price that will work and keep it afloat, then that that then it will. Uh, the FDIC is going to step in. They're not. I don't think they're going to let. I don't think the First Republic in its current form doesn't appear that it'll be around 
on Monday morning. What kind of, okay, how does that impact the people that have their money in the bank? Uh, I don't, with that First Republic Bank? Yeah, I'm looking it up. What kind of bank is this in the first place? Uh, First Republic, I believe, curtailed to uh, Are they, were they, they were public, obviously. Yeah, it's a it's, um, it's a small it's a regional uh, regional player. I didn't really see the um, I just pulled it up on Yahoo Finance. Yeah. Institutional so investors. Is it FRC is the ticker. Yeah. yeah. So it's three dollars and fifty one cents a share now. Yeah. What was it? Oh, it was six dollars. Yeah, it's sold. Off. <laughs> yeah, it's a pretty big. Uh, That's not funny. Well, maybe it's hilarious. Uh, until this year, wow. one or more envied, envied bank franchises, over $200 billion in assets at the end of the first quarter, be the third largest bank failure behind SVB and Washington Mutual. So it's up there. It's a big, uh, it's a big to do. I, I did see some stuff, and I don't want to quote on this, but it, you know, that it was, uh, you know, that they, they, um, you know, they targeted. 1,213 employees. Yeah, it's nothing small um it's definitely not a uh yeah this is not not some sort of you know minor event i mean you know the, uh, between uh, you know svb so, so uh, Sil silicon valley, uh, valley bank was you know the second largest bank failure um and this would be the third so if this fails in some fashion or another and let's face it if it's a forced sale that's you know pretty much that's pretty much a, a failure. Um, it, uh, you know, that's going to be the second and third, you know, two of the three largest bank failures in history will have been within the last, you know, two months. So what type of, well, oh, have you processed this yet? Um, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not a, it's not uh too dissimilar to the processing we were doing last time i mean um uh, you know i i uh, i i struggle i think like every, you know everybody does i mean i i have some kind of strong feeling of identifying exactly where we're at right i mean there's this just massive you know um the word i'm looking for there's just this i i guess uh you know, there's there's these there's these two powerful camps related to you know that we discussed kind of in de in detail last time that you know that the Fed uh, was you know totally late to the party, um, you know that you know we've had some real structural changes and uh, in the economy we've had you know we've got way too much money on the streets from all the spending from the last few years, you know we've got um, the Fed that you know, threw gasoline on the fire. And now in their effort to mop up the mess that they made, that they, they've they've broken something fundamentally and it it just is yet to materialize, but that we're headed for a really um, you know, we're headed for a really uh challenging period ahead, you know, or, you know, the camp that, you know, the economy is super resilient and, you know, here we are still, you know, creating jobs. Uh Pretty strongly and um you know that this is just all nothing burger and that we're going to continue to be worried about the inflation theme as the economy holds up you know quite resilient resiliently um you know you've still got you know kind of base case from a lot of you know the economic forecasters that you know we hit a very soft mild recession and then resume um you know, resume growth and, uh, and that, uh, you know, inflation is going to continue to be the dominant theme. So, you know, it's really challenging to, there's been so many head fakes along the way, right? It's like every time there's a data point that says it's one, you know, then a, a conflicting data point comes out and says it's the other. So, you know, um, I've always been a bit of a pessimist with this stuff. Um, and so, you know, my gut would tell me um, that it's 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 not as good as it seems. 
you know, but, you know, they're also at the same time, you know, there's certain, there's certain things that have been called for for years, right? You know, if you look at the Austrian economic, economic camp, you know, after 2008 uh, and, uh, you know, quantitative easing got rolled out for the first time, you know, they were calling for this massive inflation. Now, I, I believe we talked about it, right? It's like, it's one of those things where, you know, so fighting the Fed and, and fighting kind of that theme could, would have been very costly the last decade. Um, you know, it's it's very challenging to wade through because, you know, the uh, argument from the Austrians is that, all right, with all this financial wizardry that we keep, you know, dipping into our bag of tricks that nothing has changed and that we've just delayed it, right? Like the junkie that just keeps going and getting another hit until they finally crash. So it's really tough to prove or disprove until we get to a total point of clarity. So I have thoughts on it to say, but I don't, I don't, I don't, I can't really, uh, I'm not ready to move all my chips into one camp versus the other. I'll put it that way because it's, it is, um, you know, I also don't want to be fooled to think that I'm that bright that I <laughs> have mm -hmm. some, you know, have some inner, inner, uh, beat on it that you know because this is a pretty there's a lot of smart minds working through this right now trying to you know and 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 what the what it would mean for the economy and the financial markets or you know uh well, less broadly um could be substantial i mean you look at the guy uh, i forget his name now but well you look at Barry, who the big short and you look at uh paulson i mean these guys mopped up by taking the contrarian view so yeah um Anyway, I do think that so it would be very financially advantageous to be able to figure it out and get get ahead of it one way or the other. But I think that I think that largely people are trying to wrestle through this exact. When you bring up Burry and Paulson, for those that don't have a a, a deep or even a lay person understanding, what do you mean by that? Is your argument or is your point that there's going to be opportunity? But like, what do you mean by those two figures? Well, we're we're okay. So Burry was the big guy who did the big short, and he was buying. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll do my best to. It's actually we did the quote from uh, the big short yeah, at the beginning of last episode. Uh, yeah. Um, so Burry was a, a, a guy started a fund, um, a real smart guy, and he, you know, so in the last crisis, people were were there was mortgage backed securities. They were taking all these risky loans. Uh, they were there, there was a, there was a, a a strong need for fixed income assets. So of course, Wall Street got creative. They took all together all these risky assets that by themselves were just total crap, packaged them together, and then got them rated, you know, AAA in a lot of cases from the rating agencies. And then Wall Street traded them. The assumption being that if you sliced and diced and packaged up all this risk in a creative way, that spreading that risk out over, you know, a large, you know, chunks and tranches of of uh, bonds, that it somehow mitigated that risk and took a bunch of crap together and made it not crap. Um, you know, and in theory, some uh, diversification, obviously. You know, will will spread risk around, but in reality, all of the modeling was done. You know, was done based on um, the model was broken, right? So that all of the all of the underlying assets had the same Achilles heel, right? That it wasn't, you know, it wasn't tested to any level of deviation from like this historical norm of price appreciation, um, and so. Um, Everybody was oh, just got and because yeah. people were the the general citizenry were able to get homes with less yeah back to that you know they were you know they were so there was loans with you know so obviously credit quality that that's a little easier to diversify right because it's like okay even if you have higher than usual defaults because you're moving further down the credit scale you know that's a little easier to control for but what they didn't control for was um you know depreciation in home prices and um uh i think um 
because of that effect where, you know, if you'd have people- That seems oxymoronic. What, that that they didn't control for that? The influence of the consumer would raise the the price of the home. Well, it did until it didn't any, it did until it didn't anymore. (laughs) (laughs) It did, it did exactly that, you know? Yeah. But if you keep coming in, if everybody keeps coming in at the top, I mean, I mean, it was just in hindsight, it was so obvious. Um, you know, if you have people putting zero percent down with banged up credit, and 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 in many cases, a lot of these non subprime loans had like three year prepaids, but they'd have a two year arm. Like who who would have thought that that could go wrong, right? So it was a game of musical chairs. So like, yeah, you continue to bring more and more people into the buyer pool. So then it pushes up the prices and it all works until you can't continue to bring in um, more and more and more. And then at the same time, uh, and then people were tapping out their home equity lines of credit and everybody was an investor in real estate. And so then you bring those people into the sidelines and it just keep pushing it up and just everybody um, is having a party. And then when, you know, uh, I've, I've got some great charts and some buyer presentations, we've been doing investor presentations we've been doing re- lately. And if you look at the chart of the um, home, the uh, single family home completions, well, that's the technical term for it, the, the homes that they were building per year, you know, we had. 15 straight years of building above the long-term trend. And then the last four years before the collapse, I mean, it just, it's almost hyperbolic. And then at the same time, that generation that was, you know, that first time median home buyer age of, you know, 30 something um, was small and it declined. So you had this oversupply at the same time where you had low demand from a, just a, demographic standpoint and then you you eventually stopped being able to suck in new buyers through like so meaning that all of the creative financing extended the period that you could continue to bring in new buyers but eventually you run out of juice and as soon as you run out of juice and you've got all of these homes and you don't have the buyers for them, then you've got, you know, supply and demand economics, right? So home prices decline, start declining. And then you've got people who either didn't have the income. And, you know, if you don't have the income and you buy a house and you put a tenant in there and the tenant pays you, and the home price goes up by 10%, it covers up all the sins of the poor underwriting that you did to give the person the loan. But, uh, well, because I, I could be a total schmo with no actual experience or skill at being a landlord or understanding real estate or understanding my own finances. And, you know, if I buy a house at two hundred thousand with a fifteen hundred dollar mortgage, and I immediately put a tenant in there with a two thousand dollar rent, and you know, in two or three years, you know, that home is worth two hundred forty thousand, and the rent's twenty two hundred. You know, I might actually think that I'm good at investing and go out and buy more, but really, those I, are good return. Those are crazy returns. Yeah, they were. Yeah, they definitely. That's are. what it was like back then. What's that? Oh yeah, I mean it was. You know, it was tough to miss. Three years, it'd be the house would double. No, I didn't say that. I, I mean, you know, I mean, listen, it was, you know, we had double digit returns in many places for for years. Yeah, Florida, I went down. I got, you know, and I, I don't consider myself. I mean, you've, I've shared some of that story with you, where, you know, I, I was, I like to say, and I learned so much during that period, you know, but. You know, I bought in 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 Philadelphia and and um, early on in 2001 and two and three and four, and um, I was I was investing, right? I knew the markets, I knew how to you know value add and get, you know what's, you know what type of properties we could get 
you know, with opportunity, you know, with the chance to come in and, you know, improve it, you know, what markets were trending up and down. Um, and then in Florida, I like to say, so then I took some of my chips off the table in Philadelphia and I went to Florida. I thought I was astute in finding a hot market. And I guess in some ways I was. But that's when I got out of investing and I got into speculating is how I like to frame really? it. Yeah. It wasn't, I know this market, this was, it was just, geez, this went up eight, 10% last year. It looks like it's going to do it again. You know, there wasn't, I wasn't creating value. I was just making a wager that prices were going to continue to increase at that rate. And they did until they didn't, you know. Um, so yes. So then it creates people got in yeah, in insight that wisdom you garnered from that time. How can the audience benefit from that today? How is, how could one that could be potentially wrapped in speculation under the conscious guys that they're investing or they're doing right? So how could one figure that out? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, I learned so much, man. It was, I, I really do look at it today and I feel like the the the, the losses I took in Florida and the, just the real estate market in 2006 to eight in general really shaped who I, who I am today. So, um, you know, it was a dark period and I, I gave everything, you know, I gave it all back, so to speak, everything I had built from my early twenties into my late twenties. And, you know, I, I, you know, I, more than started over from scratch, put it that way after that period. And, um, you know, um, one of the things, I guess, broadly, is that it's very easy, especially as an early investor. Um, and I would say any investor can be, can be pulled into this. But first thing you want to do is you want to look first at what you can lose and not what you can gain. It's very easy to say, Man, if this ten two hundred fifty thousand dollars house goes up ten percent next year, I just created twenty five thousand in my sleep, mm. right? Okay, you know, what if it goes to two hundred and I can only rent it for fifty percent of my mortgage payment? You know, so that's the first thing is is you know you start to get to a period where you get a degree of confidence, especially you know for these folks that have only been in good markets and. So I'd say there's a crop of those folks that have popped up, you know, in the last three to five years who have a false confidence about their investing abilities because it hasn't been tested in a while. Um, so that's the first thing is, is, you know, from a risk management standpoint. And uh, as I say, looking at uh, at first what you can lose and not, not before you start counting what you can gain. Um, additionally. I mean, I think there's something to be said for the idea of not, and it was true back then, and it's it's still true today. I think there's something to be said for not completely being uh, isolated to your local market. And, you know, if you understand how how real estate works and you can understand how to read data and to structure deals that you can go to um, where where the opportunities are. Now, separate from what we're discussing of the investing versus um, speculating theme, I would argue, and I do argue often with, with investors that I do consultations with, start and master it close to home, right? Because there's other issues in the process um, that come being not being local, right? Um, I mean, you can always get a property management company. You can always have somebody manage the rehab and things like that. But those are just more challenging to, to, to do from afar. Right. Um, so, uh, I mean, well, the first thing I would say is that just naturally, I would assume that most folks would have a better network and a deeper network that uh, in the local market. Um, you know, I think there's something even when it comes to the, you know, rehab and stuff like that. I think there's all I think. I think I think just the fact that you could pop in on the project, right, and be over somebody's shoulder, even if you don't always do that, you know, keeps people a little more. I, I just feel, you know, 
getting a crew in a different area, setting that up, building those relationships. If you haven't previously been in that market, I mean, you're going to have to have a great property manager. You're going to have to have a great, um, you know, crew to do re repairs. Um, you're going to have to have a great real estate agent that is going to, you know, cause you're not going to want to fly down every other, you know, every other week. Um, and having a great real estate agent, um, you're probably not going to know, the market trends as well, although that's the easiest one of the group to to to, to do so, um, or to get to get up to speed on. But I just feel there's just more variables that could could go wrong, and so um, I think you want to master your trade as much as possible in your local market. A and B, I, I feel like you should have um, you know deeper pockets and have have more you know ability to weather um, unforeseen you know events before you go expanding too far out from your home base. You think that those those extras end up showing up on the PNL as costs one way or another? Um increase uh, risk. I mean I think that well I I I I think that it would show up I don't know if it would be extra cost. I mean you could argue all uh you know I, I'm not a big fan and if I had to do it all over I would have just built property management into my so the first time around i didn't use property management in philly um but i you know in hindsight i would have just built that into my my model from the beginning um i'm not a property manager it it's it's not dissimilar although i didn't extrapolate it out to you know the first house that we bought you know my dad and i were down there doing the work and I'll just put it this way. I'm not a, I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a handyman. Right. And so it took us like two or three times as long, you know, the door now, a lot of doors in Philly don't hang straight as you probably know, but like the doors weren't hung straight and all this stuff. And we got to the end and I looked at how much we actually saved. And I'm like, you know what? I could have found two or three more of these in the meantime. Wow. Um, and so that was the last time that we did any of our own contracting. Um, but I didn't extrapolate that out on the property management side. So my point is the original question was, do you think it shows up in the PL? I don't know that it shows up in the PL. I just think it shows up in 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 the risk of of a of a you know buying a property too high or maybe in a market that's you know marginal that isn't as you know isn't exactly what you're you know I mean think of it this way right I remember even being from the area. I remember real estate agents as far back as, you know, in the early 2000s that would take a property on, you know, 54th Street and they'd be out there pitching it as 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 University City. Right. And and like, you know, the, even though the line was moving, the mm. dividing line was like the low four, high 30s, low 40s back then. I'm going off of memory. Right. But it's like, you know, if you're from Florida investing in Philly the other way around now. And somebody's like University City, and you're doing all this research. You're like, oh man, University City is hot, right? You don't realize that those three or four blocks in that direction is 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 just a massive difference. Um, and if you've got a real estate agent that you know has commission breath, <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, oh, this thing's this is going to be hot. This is oh, it's University City, blah blah blah, right? I mean, you just made a major error that could cost you in the long term and 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 it's just that very small nuance. does that happen sure yeah do, do you think that's partly why or it, there could always be opportunity for people that do know because i'm thinking now if i'm, I'm a listener th thinking bill's a smart guy at one time he's made mistakes he's had to learn from i i feel smart i'm a listener i've learned the hard way isn't it part of the opportunity in life is that person that bought that thing too high because they didn't have the education or the knowledge the the proximity whatever reason it ends up going you know that now they got to get it off and they're they're in duress or they're in stress and maybe that's the opportunity for somebody else to buy so i'm just like thinking you know is there a theme even in this conversation of whatever uncertainties there are right now in the macro side that we started today. So what are your thoughts on that? I think there's always, yes, those opportunities or 
some variant of what you just described is always going to be there. It's why, you know, when you're newbie or your mom and pop investor, you know, considering dipping their toes into it, and they say, man, this, you know, Bill was sharing on the last podcast that, you know, 20% of homes are being bought, you know, by investors, you know, and it's these big money investors and all. I mean, there's always going to be opportunity around the margins, right? Um, you know, not everything is going to model out perfectly. Not everything is going to be captured by, you know, some quant or some, you know, big firm, you know, who's just, um, you know, who's just, uh, you know, just kind of doing things in mass, you know, there's always going to be opportunity. And that's why I say about the, you know, the hyper-local aspect that, you know, hyper-local could be 30, 40 minutes from your house. Right. Um, but, you know, because there's just, there's just going to be those, those one-offs and those, uh, whether it's, you know, driving neighborhoods, whether it's, you know, scouring, you know, less, uh, you know whether it's uh, having good real estate contacts who who have those those opportunities that that pop up before they've kind of hit the mainstream or hit the hit the wire, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I think those are always the opportunities, and and really those are always going to be your best your best plays. Um, so I don't think that that is that those types of those types of scenarios are, you know will show show themselves in any market. Um, and so the, those looking for for those types of things, I think, are going to be kind of evergreen and not something that is going to be. Um, I mean, of course, you got to look at the macro, but, you know, the larger kind of theme and direction of things. But, you know, there's always going to be people that bought too high. There's all, always going to be people who, you know, bought a house that somebody with deeper pockets could have absolutely turned into a, a winner. But got, you know, they took out a hard money loan. Right. They might have bought it at a great price, but they took out a hard money loan. They didn't it, it, they didn't, you know, plan for the carrying costs. They thought they had a funding source that they didn't actually have. Mm -hmm. um, they had a contractor that, uh, you know, ran away with uh, happy to a buddy of mine, you know, ran, ran away with some dancer down to Florida in the middle of a project and uh, leaves Stop. leaves them. Uh, you know, leaves them, leaves the project in the middle of it. And now they can't get another contractor in there and their hard money notes come and do. And those opportunities are always going to be there. Right. And so, you know, so it could be that person that overpaid that needs to get out and it could be any one of those types of scenarios. So those, um, it's tough to build an investment theme around that. Um, but it, it, it's, it's, you know, yes. You said Look at what you can lose, not what you can gain. Or at least look for, well, you can, you need to eventually look at what you can gain, but you need to be willing to look at it hard through that prism first. Um, you know, if, if you become so hung up on and enamored by the upside, it can blind you to the downside risks. And then you said, these are some good quotes, good markets. Or no, I'm paraphrasing something you said. Sorry. I wrote this down though. Good markets create false confidence. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you got into investing in 2003 and you bought 10 or 15 properties in Florida in 2003 to 2005, you thought you were a real estate god. Um, and um, where could there be false confidence today? And, and I'll ask that because Kierkegaard said, life can only be understood backwards, but it must be lived forwards. That's why I think there's so much value in asking you about the, although on the last podcast, you disproved in your, your, your mind or our audience's benefit. You don't think it's like 2008 right now. However, life can only be understood backwards and must be lived forward. So what can we draw from the past so we can approach whatever we are in now in a, in a more, in the most constructive way. So um, can you unpack that a little bit? The, yeah. Um, where could there be false confidence today? Yeah, I, that's, that's actually a great question because, um, you know, we did talk about, and I still maintain that I don't, I don't see, um, 
I don't see a broad real estate pullback. Um, but I think that I think that um, I, I do think that we could see a substantial economic dislocation, if you will. I just am not convinced that that is going to spill over into um, into into real estate per se. Um, so, um, you know, I would say that um, for a person who's not a professional investor, um, that you know, being cognizant of that that backdrop, who needs their full time job to, um, you know, to 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 make the real estate machine. Um, run you know i think that um i think that's one one thing to consider i think somebody who is over leveraged and not doesn't have enough liquid reserves um it's not with it's not a stretch to think that and then if you have tenants that are a little bit further down the credit quality scale that um you know, so let's say somebody has 10 properties in an area with folks that are likely to be impacted by high unemployment and and issues there, right? And it's like, so my theme could be, my theme that real estate is going to stay supported and may actually continue to grow at a, at, a, at a strong clip in certain areas, many areas. But let's say you've got 10 properties. And so let's say that could be true. But if you have four tenants that all of a sudden stop paying you in an area that is not landlord friendly friendly as it relates to um as it relates to evictions, you know, um, would would you be able to um would you be able to weather that storm or would you be that isolated incident of, hey, it's a great overall market, but here's this person that just got themselves in over their head and needs to now fire sale these properties to, to clean up the mess. My next question that came from that, the context, what about a business that is illiquid or, you know, that's relative, but so it's, anyway, I'll ask the question first illiquid leveraged and client relationships that are not ironclad say that again one more time what about a business so like i'll preface this a little bit all of us you and me and then all the listeners we're all tied to a business one way or another businesses we work alongside for we are or are not, you know, we're all tied to businesses. So what about business that is, you know, because businesses have liquidity or illiquidity, and that's on a spectrum based on their debt, their debts, their leverage. So what what about a business that is illiquid or 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 isn't sure where its liquidity is relative to its debt structures, its leverage use, and client relationships? that are not ironclad. I would argue anyone anyone listening to this that has a business that doesn't know if their client relationships are ironclad or not, doesn't have ironclad relationships. That would be my opinion on that. So, yeah. So, so that's my, I want to kind of make this even more contextual to all of us. What are your thoughts on that? What about businesses? Because then I want, yeah. Anyway, that's my first. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I think, Absolutely. If we broaden this conversation out beyond real estate, then, you know, there's all sorts of additional applications that that, uh, you know, to what we're discussing. Um, you know, in, in a scenario in a scenario where, you yeah, know, because then the, the, the amount, the, the 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 examples where the real estate market stays very strong, just to kind of close the loop on that. But yet the kind of thesis that you're kind of putting out there, you know, plays out of, you know, people that, you know, looking at what you can lose first and, um, you know, having a false sense of confidence. Um, 
you know, there's still examples and I just, you know, rattled off one very quickly off the top of my head, but there's less of that, right? Because there's, it's more forgiving, even if you get yourself in trouble, because then you just sell those properties, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but when you broaden it out to um, business as a whole, then, then now it becomes far more applicable, right? So, um, you know, and I'll, you know, and staying within my wheelhouse, um, although I could, definitely talk talk about things outside of it but you know if you're a mortgage person and you're doing great business right but you're still reliant on um real estate agents and now those real estate agents don't hold up as well in a market right and now people that have been steady you know sending you a deal a month for you know the last four or five years there's going to be winners and there's going to be losers and if you're over rely overly reliant on you know, a certain, uh, a certain segment, a certain group. Um, uh, now all of a sudden, you know, you've got to pivot and you've got to change your whole business model. Right. And so, you know, with business owners, um, you know, I don't know, they could have, they could have suppliers, right. What would happen? What would happen if, how, how overly concentrated are you and reliant on a particular supplier? And what would happen if that supplier went belly up tomorrow? Right. What would that do to your business? Do you have a contingency mm. plan? Would that take you out? Right. With the amount of time, with the demand that you have to deliver your your product and, you know, a, a lack of additional suppliers at, at, a, at a at a quality or a price point that allows your business to stay open. Uh, if there's a lack of them available and you don't have a contingency plan. What would that do to your business? Because that's a that's something that could happen, right? In a in a contraction, because that supplier might might have too much risk on the books. That supplier might, you know, whatever fill in the blank of 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 the uh, that, that supplier might be over leveraged. That um, whatever fill in the blank. Um, you know, if you are a business that's, you know primary customer is you know middle america with disposable income and all of a sudden uh, and, and and you have a product that's um something that people aren't going to buy in really challenging economic times um you know what what happens to, to your business then right it doesn't take a lot in certain areas for there to be a shift it just breaks the model down of what you've been doing. Mm. And so spending some time thinking about that is a valuable pursuit. Um, and it, I, I don't know how storms can be weathered without values. Well, that's your, uh, <laughs> that's, that's well, I'm your trying way. to figure right. Unless yeah. someone, you know, so then it makes me worry, though, about our culture, because if our whole culture had, was, uh, was if quantitative easing is at the bedrock of the last X amount of a decade plus, yeah. then what if there's a film, like an invisible film? Kind of covering the whole milieu, and the film. When the film finally fades, it's like you. It's it's like the lights coming on at three thirty, two forty five in the morning, at the nightclub Saturday night. <laughs> I'm sorry for that analogy, but anybody that's ever been a, you know. <laughs> it's a great analogy okay thank you well okay so this is what where my anxiety comes from well no that's not where my anxiety comes from. anxiety <laughs> is <a> result. <laughs> yeah that would be a result of existing in you know the eternal i haven't you know taken the leap but uh <laughs> an elevated anxiety right anxiety uh is like Okay, what will be the consequences to our culture if, without self awareness, we've been programmed to think certain things, be be certain things, 
in relation to other certain things, you know, act certain narratives out because I don't know what I've been thinking about this a lot lately, especially all these conversations that I've been having with you and and, and others uh, around this topic. So, what are your thoughts on that? What what if, what consequence could could that have? And then, I guess a more practical question would be. Is there time for each of us, me, you, the listeners, to get our houses in order? To get real clear what, you know, in our personal PL, our business, our life PL, and figure out how we can um, you know, be not only be on the other side of this, but win in, in this. In this in this time, and then potential um, calam- calamity. Because I I'm thinking it's like two thirty in the morning. The lights haven't come on yet. Yeah, well, I'll try to. I'll take a stab here. We'll see if I can land as well as you did. But at, an, at another analogy, uh, to to kind of further this point, um, think of the NFL every 10 to 15 years went and made significant rule changes. And it still was kind of football as you know it, we know it, but with big twists, right? So touchdowns became four points rather than six. six. Field goals became four points also. Uh, you had the game got extended by 50%. Uh, you were only allowed to pass on two downs out of four. All of a sudden, there's going to be a new set of winners. People with a really great kicker are going to thrive. Hmm. People with a better running game are going to thrive. Younger teams that have just generally better conditioning, right? Or younger players versus the other that are going to hold up in longer games are going to thrive. And some of the tried and true parts of the game will remain, but there's a new paradigm that everybody's playing within. And that's clearly going to create winners and losers um and 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 it's going to take some teams that might have been either super bowl champs or knocking on the door and it's going to move them to the back of the pack right and it's going to bring a new set of players in um and in these periods of big shifts from the easy money you know overbuilding you know orgy of real estate investing in 2006 to 2008, you know, or if there's an end to the easy money period of the last 10 to 15 years, I think you could liken that to a big shift in the rules, right? We're still playing football, but we're playing within a new framework. Mm -hmm. Now, if this had gone on for in the NFL to continue the analogy for a period of 50 years. And while you didn't know exactly what the rule changes were going to be, you had some ability to use context clues or use past changes to try to understand what those future changes would be, then you would manage your football team differently. Right. If you're so focused, if you're completely convinced that these are the rules and these rules are going to be here forever, then you're going to build everything about your team based on this framework. But if you know that the framework is going to change, and while you don't know exactly what it's going to change, you might be able to use your brain or you might be able to talk to advisors or you might be able to spend some time thinking about what that shift is going to look like so that you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket. Um, 
and you're playing some for the current, you know, the short term and the middle term, but you're also having a mind for being still relevant or alive in the NFL with that shift, then you would manage things much differently. And so um, I think it would be very challenging to, um, I think it would be very challenging to try to make this land perfectly for every individual that might be listening to this. But, you know, I, I would say if you have, if, if, if you're completely locked into the way that you've been doing business for the last 10 years and you haven't started to think about those questions that I asked, right? What if, the cost of credit stayed elevated for the next five years? What if it increased further? What if, you know, all of a sudden a bunch of suppliers went out of business? What if the current people I'm selling to all of a sudden didn't have a significant amount of disposable income? What if, what if, what if, you know, back to the discussion of, um, you know, people getting a false sense of confidence um or or being um you know kind of locked in and think that just because things have been going this way that they're going to continue going this way um and not having spent any time um just in general housekeeping uh oh, okay i recognize that i can't possibly envision all of those scenarios and so if some scenario or rule change happened that I feel like I'm smart enough and have a great enough team around me that when the pivot comes, I'll be able to figure it out. But what's my risk in the period while I'm figuring it out? And am I in a position to weather that? Right. Um, well, and and so I think we have to always be aware that if, if we're asking when it comes, we're in it, in the coming. It yeah. never comes. There's something I, I came from Howard Marks. I recommend his books. Um, Market Cycles is the, I'm paraphrasing the one. And I was just reading it this morning. Um, it's a really, oh, it's called The Most Important Thing. And there's 20 chapters. And each chapter is the most important thing. Yeah. <laughs> It's such a great book. I'm actually re-listening to it, which is something I generally don't do. I've started to do more generally, which is another topic. But the most important thing, there's never a bottom. Well, like we don't know when the bottom's coming of anything. We couldn't because, well, we'd be in it. It's like a pre it's a time. It's a it, it confuses the mind essentially. Well, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, this is what I wrote down from your analogy. Um, change your questions, change your to change your assumptions, to adapt to change, to benefit from change. Yeah, yeah, or or to benefit from or to survive. You know, I mean, you could say the glass half full, glass half empty. Um, I think so many people, and I've been guilty of it myself. Well, but isn't it both? Isn't that the whole thing? Because if it's half full, it's also half empty. And yep. isn't it about really understanding that it's a glass and you can drink it and you can throw it at someone and you can, you know, never drink it. And like, it's like, ah, it's that binary thinking that I get stuck in, you know, every day in every way. Well, another way that we could frame it, that we could say it is that the first step in capitalizing on the market change is surviving. <laughs> if you don't survive, then you're not able to thrive, right? And so like, and then well, back to- Would that to bring the, us to what you said earlier? I'm a, a, I was uh, just going there. I, well, I get, I, I was, yeah, well, the, yeah, I was just going there with it. You nailed it, which is exactly right. If you don't look at first what you can lose or you look at what you gain. And and, and that, I think that's a- it. it, it do you think there's a level of, so this word, do you think there's a level of, emotional maturity that it necessitates that thinking 
Emotional maturity. Um, I mean, I mean, you know, maybe emotional maturity is not the way, the most philosophical way to put it. I I, I think that there is. I think that there's a, 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 a emotional maturity. You, you could perhaps say it that way, or or just a uh, a life or business maturity. That you know, I think that. I think that it's a natural human state, right? Um, especially if you're kind of that entrepreneur that, I mean, does anybody really get born saying, oh, you know, as like a golden child of entrepreneurship or business that, you know, it's just kind of a expected you're going to be successful. I mean, a lot of entrepreneurs I know didn't come from a whole lot and it doesn't mean that they all came from the bottom, so to speak, but, you know, and so it's like, you figure it out, right. You've got, you're like, all right, I, I, I figured this thing out and I'm making good money now. And I'm no, I would argue that you're, you're right. And that uh, the, uh, the idea of an entrepreneur that isn't, that doesn't come from struggle. They're in conflict. This first and a second generation is in conflict because the, 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 the fruit of, the, the 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 physical fruit of the embodiment of you know the fruit of the word of the founder which would be the child the child you know the progeny of the word of the founder meaning that you know it was their thoughts words deeds that led that presupposed the success of the business and not the failure there's an implicit entitlement and and, and essentially it changes the entrepreneur this you know the second generation is more of a a manager or an operator or there's just it's a different completely different psychology it doesn't negate the propensity or possibility of being entrepreneurial but it's a completely i just want to you know yeah it's a completely well, well, well. different um paradigm so yes to just to acknowledge what you said yeah the entrepreneur is the self you know that idea of self-starter there's an inversion there's a there's a negation there's a there's a lack thereof there's a there's a lack. The lack presupposes the opposite of lack. <laughs> yeah. <Again. laughs> yeah. You know, and and so when you, I know for me, right. You know, when I first, when I first, you know, was doing well in real estate, that was my, that was my, my mindset, right? Like I got this, I figured it out and I spent so much time. I was so excited by feeling like I had kind of figured the formula out. Um, that I built everything around that formula, right? And spent all of my time and blinders mm. on to that formula and hadn't evolved. And that could be the maturity word that you're looking to recognize that the formula, and, and it becomes, it's very tough to hear a podcast like this or to read a book and in the moment when it feels like that formula is clicking and working to understand that you need to level it up and get ahead of. Those yeah. The terms. natural occurrence would be to say that we're both haters and losers. Yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. And that's we're, why we're the, we're the cynics. We're the negative people. We're talking. Yeah. You just don't know this time around, or this, this is bulletproof. Or Gotta this get rid of us. Recession, uh, recession proof, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and the, and the, I think Bill, the natural thing is to just hate your neighbor. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, and, and listen, you know, yeah. let's face it, you know, I mean, part of in my, in my belief system, you know, part of being a good entrepreneur is being a, an eternal optimist, right? I think it's an important part for a lot of them, right? Feeling like I'm going to figure this out. I'm all going to be okay. Like I, you know, you start to trust your own, you know, your own, um, you know, your own abilities to, you know, because if you, you know, if you if you did figure out that formula, you figure, oh, you know, you, you either you either don't see the potentials or you over rely on your ability to just pivot and figure it out. And until you've actually lived through it, you know, it's one of those things. And hopefully, I mean, besides just the um, intellectual pursuit of what we're doing here, but in trying to actually add value to to people it's like it's one of those things that if you can learn some of it from other people's wisdom or mistakes then you're ahead of the you're ahead of the curve right maybe if i'd have listened 
to somebody sharing information like this in 2005 i might have i might have positioned myself slightly slightly differently you know i do think that there's an aspect of actually having lived through it that you know if you do it at an early enough age and you can bounce back from it that is the 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 the, the real life is going to give you even more experience and wisdom than you know the textbook so to speak the metaphorical textbook of hearing others but you know the fact is is that it it it, it um you know it's it's you know you basically you have to um you have to you have to be prepared for those different You guys have to be prepared for those different outcomes, right? And, um, you know, and essentially. <laughs> all right so um so essentially yeah so what you have you have to be prepared you have to be prepare yourself for those those scenarios right and so i think that just um you know i i would call it on time in my business you know another thing of, of entrepreneurs and, and busy individuals is you get so much time working in the business so i think right now you know, spending time taking a walk or on a long drive or being intentional about building time into your calendar to think uh, uh, about, you know, the macroeconomics, to think about the, um, you know, you know, ancillary party parties and partners and the interconnectivity of your business and, and, and thinking through and, um, stress testing where those potential you know risks are um for shifts um and and doing your best to um to think through and to plan for what that might look like um and then read, additionally read that text. let's let's read this i want your thoughts on this this quote because i think it's in addition to what you're saying, like where we're, where I think this, where this is going, right? So the quote is, but in capitalist reality, as distinguished from its textbook picture, it is not that kind of competition, which counts, but the competition from the new commodity, the new technology, the new source of supply, the new type of organization, parentheses, the largest scale unit of control, for instance. Competition which commands a decisive cost or quality advantage and which strikes not at the margins of the profits and the outputs of the existing firms, but at their foundations and their very lives. Nailed it. Nailed Joseph it. Schumpeter, by the way, like Joseph Schumpeter, he was a prophet of like, nailed it right God. that that's exactly what we're talking about and 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 i and i think from reading that you know we're talking about those risks within the context of these big market shifts where i think it's the most it's the most um likely that those types of risks would materialize but any industry can have those types of risks appear at any time. It doesn't even have to be at a market shift, right? Just as business and technology evolves. So this, this could be, this, this is very relevant during the current period. You know, it makes me think maybe there's hope in the fact that if technology is so rapidly evolving, we see this with, yes, at this point, my opinion of chat GPT is it's pretty dumb because everyone, it's just aggregating really information, which is very useful for one that's interested in aggregating the information. 
but it's not smarter. You know, I'm not impressed by it at this juncture. I'll just leave it at that to not to waste more time. But I'm impressed by the fact that it exists and who knows what the 10th edition is going to be. But isn't it like, what if the rapid pace of advancement with technology will help us offset the implicit entitlement of cheap, dumb money for the last 15 years? What if, you know, where people say, oh my God, technology is going to replace all the jobs. What if our what if everything in life is backwards and it's actually the opposite? Because of technology, we're not going to blow up in a fireball. It's actually the technology's rapid ev evolution and change. It's going to end up making Main Street better and burdening some of this entitlement and lack of values that our culture has had to be challenged by. by the lack of, right? It has had to not act down because of the cheap money, the dumb money. I, my, what I mean by cheap money is, that's pretty simple, right? Yeah. Cheap, less costly. What I mean by dumb money is, the more I lie to myself, the more I speculate. The more I speculate, the dumber my money is. So my, my, my glass half full, as we're going to just, you know, beat that down, is... Maybe everything we fear about technology is actually us projecting and it's all backwards. And this is a, this is a renaissance. This is a revolution. Yeah. Maybe bill, you, you won't exist in a couple of years. Maybe what I'm doing won't either. Cause hopefully there, there's no need of um, coaches and advisors and things. Cause eventually, you know, that would mean that we all had parents, <laughs> you know, like whatever. Good. Well, I, I like say I want to admit on this episode that I believe that I haven't done enough. I believe I'm entitled. I believe I've been entitled, even though there's all this pain around, you know, the, the fact that I, I did choose to leave home at 18 and, you know, I'm almost 32. I've been on my own and I've started things and they've not worked out and started Hmm. Ultra Matters is is working. Uh, I mean, but 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 what does that even mean? You know, I, I'm in the. I'm always breaking it. I'm trying to break it every day. But like, God, I got to do better and and move faster. And I just think that if I'm not honest with myself, that I am entitled by being a part of the economy since the quantitative e easing started, then I'm not even awake. I know I just said so much. I confused myself, but <laughs> like, I just got to say that out loud. Like this is AA, you know, hi, I'm Jay. And I've been on quantitative easing. <laughs> oh man. Haven't we all? It's it's the first all, step I, as a business owner, I need to be honest with myself. Hi, I'm Jay. I've been able to help people with their company culture. They've been able to pay for it because they have more, they've had a higher purchasing power. Like I need to be honest with myself yeah, and then figure out how the hell am I going to adapt as a firm? Because my core belief is culture is going to matter more than ever because when there's less dumb money and less cheap money, culture is going to be everything. It's going to be about character. It's going to be how we work with our clients. It's going to be how we work with our peers. It's going to be how we work period. And that's culture. But damn, I got to, you know, we, I gotta break this thing first. I gotta not be a, a, a BSer to myself. I hi, my name's Jay. I am a quantitative easing baby. Yeah, uh, 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 man, you have your you've got your finger right on the on the pulse with that because I mean this 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 is applicable to because this isn't this isn't specific to any industry. There's no you know, when you're talking about, you know, cheap money and how the economy has been running and how, you know, um, you know, how, how the the government's been running in terms of funding levels in both both parties at this point for, uh, you know, the last generation, um, you know, nobody is exempt from a, a shift in how in the operating environment. 
right? And and you know, talking about those rule changes, right? Uh, you know that that analogy with the the rule changes in football. It's like you know, you could find yourself in an environment where the services that you provide are more valuable and needed than ever, but the ability for certain individuals to pay for and finance those become more challenging, right? And then what does that look like for you, right? Just to keep it on you of like, okay, I've got this thing now that people need and want more, Mm. but my ability to deliver it in the format that I've been delivering it up until this point has now changed, right? What does that look like? And that's not for us to do here now, right? Whether it's a way to get it out on more scale to more users at a, at a smaller smaller level or whether it's to go significantly deeper with the people who are insulated from that, whatever that looks like, right? And you could literally probably spend, and I'm not, wouldn't be surprised if you start spending, you know, and haven't already spent some time thinking, you know, thinking that through, but that's, that's exactly what we're talking about here. What is this? Right. Or that's one potential, you know, one potential scenario. What other potential scenarios are there? Right. And how even even if there's not a calamitous event, if the film, if the film is gone, that invisible film, behavior is going to change up the chain to down the chain. We're on Main Street. We're not on Wall Street. Yep. All the behaviors are going to change. Even if it's not a calamitous event and the economy doesn't fall completely apart well it's the it's, it's the events changed. that aren't calamitous that i think are the are even harder to prepare for right it's like the you know frog getting boiled in a pot right and it's like my sit because it's it, it's in those calamitous events you've either prepared for it or you haven't and when it hits you're either going to survive it or you're not Right. But it's the person that's in that, like, slowly, consistently evolving, right, whose current framework is still working. Mm. But that change is incrementally coming on and getting them closer to this inflection point where it no longer works. And now they're not prepared for it. Damn. That that's that's the bigger risk, I think. And so back to this mindset. For business owners and entrepreneurs of of needing to challenge the current, I'm going to just keep using that word framework because it works here. But like that current framework that they're operating in, right? That they're the rule set that they're operating in. Who's not challenging that and thinking through and trying to evolve it? Um, that I think you know runs the most the most risk. Um, you know, I'm looking back at the quote again, the capitalist reality. Um, not the kind of competition which counts uh new commodity new technology new source of supply um not at the margin strikes not at the margins of the profit or the outputs right and uh but at the very foundation so like you know that that that's that you know the 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 margins and the uh outputs of the existing firms right that's that's the that's the rule set that people and I and I have and and still continue right like that's the day to day right who's that new hot player coming into the market oh these guys stepped in uh, oh X Y Z Bank just went public which means they're going to start putting out you know low margin you know maybe even just you know using losing certain products as a loss leader to gain market share right like those are your day to day risks that is part of the natural. I think more natural for most folks, myself included, to focus on. Um, But I I don't think that most people and myself included spend enough time focusing on those those things outside, right? To go back to that foot Mm. that football analogy, right? Of of like, you know, I don't know if I'll nail it, but you know, you've got oh, this guy's got this new player. They got a big line or more of a shift to people with big offensive lines and a bigger running game. How to like, that's the natural, but like nobody prepares for those rule changes or nobody prepares for all of a sudden um, you're not allowed to have a dome. Right. And so now like those, those kind of outside external um, factors that, that, um, that I think uh, have, have the, it's like, we're all been playing within this maze here 
and focusing on the risks within this maze, but we haven't we haven't allowed ourselves to think about the what's outside of that particular framework. I don't know if I I, I nailed it. Yeah. I got a little off that, but you know that that's it's it's that idea of of you know you know we're focusing on you know we're focusing on this you know specific set of challenges and stuff and things that are in our common in our day to day and our week to week and month to month from our industry um but ignoring these outside forces that step into all of our well you know whether it's outside forces in our particular industry or whether it's outside forces like the easy money um you know whether it's a big shift in government spending because the the um you know the 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 financial markets put constraints on on what what the government can do um you know i mean there's the, those types of factors Bill, I think. can you imagine a scenario where let's talk about the republic for a second no one's willing to claim their balance sheet because the the companies can choose right at this stage of our political system to not have to do anything they don't want to do i mean maybe at varying degrees um so no one does, right? Do you think there's a scenario where our our state government is not going to get involved at some point? State government, or I'm mean, sorry, our, our government, our, our our like get in get involved, like inter like inter intervene in the markets. Yeah, I mean, I'll make it more clear. I I'm going to make a statement, and then I want your thoughts. I can't see how our culture will will back away from the government getting involved in macro economic issues even you know so i can't see that reality like we we've, we've been there we've done that now the behavior is has been done it's been accepted and my my be belief would be it would continue so that's my that's my statement yeah i i i think that I think that you're correct. I think that the gene, and, and this isn't even new. I mean, this, you know, back with long-term LT, long-term capital management, I believe it was, so at the uh, company that made the big yeah. bet on the, uh, on Russia, Russian, uh, Russian currency back in 98. And it was our buddy Geithner who was in at that time who uh, engineered that whole first bailout. And that was, that was, um, I, I'm not studied enough in, you know, the Fed and, financial markets broadly be before that time period but um um that was really the first you know kind of big intervention that created uh yeah the um some would argue that that created the current uh what's the term for it um when you take the risk um What's that term? Uh, I don't worry about when you um, moral hazard, um, right? Of of you know, I mean, capitalism doesn't work or becomes disjointed. And capitalism is a carrot and a stick. This is how I've heard it framed, right? It doesn't work when you only have the carrot, right? If you don't carry the stick and you're not willing to allow people to fail, then something becomes broken in the fundamental mechanisms of capitalism and you know we've refused we'll break out a little stick or we'll 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 beat the underlings right but we're afraid to allow um the big players now it's easy to sit here literally in an armchair and to make these t <laughs> and to to judge these things um you know it's easy to be a purist when you're not the one responsible now you know the counter argument could be like have we became interconnected to a, a point economically where that that's required that doesn't mean that it's going to work but you know is there some legitimacy to the idea that we're so interconnected that allowing these these things to fail would actually bring the whole system down you know, and and you could yeah, be it's like this. damned if you do, damned if you don't. If the whole system went down, then we're definitely going to be in war. Yeah, and and it's easy to be this, you know, Austrian purist, you know, or uh, you know, free market purist, and say, 
you know, oh, well, the system needs it. The system has to purge itself. And it, and once it does purge itself, you know, it'll find its natural baseline and build back up from a, you know, from the right place. But um, so at the end of the day, um, you know, so so back to the 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 the, the question at hand. Um, you know, I don't think that the government I mean, and it's been from both parties. Right. And then there's, of course, the some would call it the deep state. Others would just call it the, um, you know, let's face it, you know, whoever gets in the office, there's departments and there's the Fed and there's all of these things that run fairly independently um, of the specific regime that's in the office. Um, and these things have been happening in both parties for the last, you know, 25 years. Um, and so, you know, they, they'll they each put a different spin on it, right? But nobody has been, you know, Bush was in charge with TARP, right? And that bailout, um, you know, the first big, although it was nothing compared to the monstrosities that came during the Biden administration, but the first big COVID tranche was done under Trump, right? So there, there, you, you, you don't see a significant distinction. So the fact is, I think that we've opened up Pandora's box, and I agree that I don't know that it's going to close itself. Now, the only things that would close it would be just the markets, right? Like you, you can only beat the markets for so long. And at the end of the day, our ability to do what we do um, still relies on the debt markets and still relies on, you know, a global um, system that plays along with it. Um, and at the moment, and maybe forever, there's two camps to this thought, but, you know, it would be more harmful for everybody else not to play along with it than to play along with it. Um, at some point, international players, in my estimation, would be smart to, just like we're talking about as businesses, figuring out the different potentials to say, okay, if these guys are not going to get their house in order, right now we're relying on them for everything, but you know, how do we get our, and you hear about this, right? You hear, you hear about it for a decade or more. Of, uh, they're going to start trading oil in XYZ, right? They're going to, uh, there's going to be another basket of currencies to get off the dollar dependency, right? Yada, yada, yada. No, it's never, never materialized. And there's some people that say that it won't materialize, that, you know, the world's hooked on dollars and hooked on our system and that they can't, um, you know, um, they can't uh, break away from it. Um, but so, 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 so I think that it's, uh, yeah, I, 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 I just, the market's rejecting and eventually saying enough's enough um, could force, you know, the inability to, uh, to, 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 to continue to intervene. Um, but we talked about this briefly on our last call where because we're the reserve currency and because of the federal reserve, you know, we may not be able to do, we may not be able to, enter into the markets and, and, and intervene with monetary policy, but we could always do it with fiscal policy and the Fed and money printing. Um, and so I think it's far more likely of now, if you feel like that we're heading towards a cliff, um, I feel it's far more likely that we would inflate our way out of it than we would allow it to come crashing down. In Conclusion to this piece of the puzzle, what would be your advice to the, someone listening to this right now who is thinking, what should I do Q2? Well, I think that Q2. All right. So I, I think well, that, really, that, that makes, really. I was hoping you weren't going to ask me <laughs> about what to do in 2025 or 24. <laughs> <laughs> no, right now, like, what are we doing? What's this, what's our call to action? Yeah. I mean, 
hey, you know, I mean, I don't know if this is going to be a sexy answer, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, I think that it's worthwhile. It's certainly worth, you know, I think philosophically, and I think, I think there's beyond just philosophically, I think there's value in, 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 in asking some of the challenging questions about the future of global economics, future of U.S. economics. Um, I think uh, having these types of discussions allows more context that then allows for those, uh, that thought process around the, the various what ifs in, in, in the macro and in our specific industries. And so without spending some time on it, um, you know, I think you're missing a big piece of the puzzle. However, it's very easy to get, um, it's very easy once you start going, opening that, that box up to then get stuck in that loop and worrying about those types of things. And it's funny in my office, I, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some particular set of challenges or something we're going through. And I'll always come back to, you guys know what the answer to all this is, right? More loans, <laughs> more loans. Let's that's go get funny. some more loans, right? And that's like a metaphorical way of saying like, we're still here and now, and we just need to put the, the, the head, you know, head down and grind and do what we're, you know, we I'm are in this context today, right? And so, and so, you know, I think that, um, I think that if anybody was listening to this, I would say that um, that idea of carving out some of those time to think about those external risks, right? To think about a potential shift and, and, and you know, just starting to apply that kind of mindset and idea of, 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 of as the leader of an organization, thinking about, you know, the evolution and those external risks and those macro risks. Um, and and creating and making that part of of your routine to start thinking about those things so that you're not caught flat footed. Um, but beyond that, you know, the number one way to insulate from that is is to put your head down and work with, uh, you know, so if you're like me, that from time to time, I have these massive periods of growth. And then, you know, I don't want to say I get burnt out because I don't know that I ever allow myself to get truly burnt out. But you know, I have some stagnation from time to time, right? Because you can only keep that switch turned on and, you know, super high gear for so long before you need to recharge the battery. But, you know, I feel like the answer is more business, right? And that's why I say it may not be a sexy answer, but like, if you know that you may be entering a period of time where you're going to need to be, you know, you're going to need to be as financially sound as possible. You're going to need to be as on and alert and and whatever is possible. Like, you know, you know, I would double down right now, right? If you're entering into one of these transition periods and a period that will have simultaneously quite a bit of risk, but also opportunity, then that's all the more reason to go into it as strong as possible, all the more reason, you know, you know, whether it's financially sound or just on your game and, and firing on all pistons. Um, and so I, I would say that, you know, um, whatever that means, whether that's a team meeting, whether that's, you know, taking taking a weekend and 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 really kind of recalibrating and and doubling down on your business plan, um, you know that that's that's really what I've been doing and and that's what um, I think I think would be would be wise to do right now. I don't know how to necessarily apply that to everybody's individual industry, but I think some of those things are, are universal. <laughs>